Today in Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look at Titus the Fox. Or are we? This is gonna take a bit of explaining, so bear with me. Foxes have been my most favorite animals since pretty much forever, way before the internet even existed, back at a time when American and Canadian culture mostly ignored them or depicted them as sly, evil chicken murderers. Suffice to say, I wasn't buying any of that, and thus as a kid, I was constantly on the lookout for anything about them that was done on a more positive note. Disney's Robin Hood ended up being one of my most favorite animated films, Tails ended up being my most favorite animated character for the longest time, and Star Fox, well... And let's just say that franchise was way stronger in the SNES and N64 days. But even as a kid, I was aware of the game Titus the Fox, as there was both the DOS and Game Boy releases of it that I could have saved up for myself or asked for as a gift for my parents, but I never got it. I never even played it. Even back then, in my desperate searches for anything good about foxes, something about this game was stopping me from wanting it. And now that I'm older, I can finally put my finger on exactly what it was that was subconsciously holding me back. Titus doesn't have a tail. Big bushy tails are one of the defining features of these critters, and yet Titus doesn't have one. So my subconscious clearly picked up on this and realized there was something up with this game based on that fact alone. And now that I've finally played it, my subconscious wasn't wrong. Titus the Fox is actually just a reskin of a completely different game called Le Gaff, Les Aventures de Mokhtar, a platformer developed around famous French celebrity Vincent Le Gaff, who wasn't really well known outside of France, thus why they decided to reskin the game with a sort of generic mascot type character based on their own logo. This explains Titus' lack of a tail, along with why there's a lot of Arabian styling to the game's art and music, as the premise of Mokhtar was that of an Arab man who ends up lost in a big city and is trying to find his way back home. Another giveaway of this is that when you start up Titus the Fox nowadays, it pokes fun at you playing it so many years later, but the joke message refers to Mokhtar despite the reskin. Anyways, with all of that out of the way, the question remains, is this game any good? And the answer is... sorta. A lot of people like to describe this game as painfully average, but I think the better analogy, now that I've played it, is this game can be considered good in the same way Battletoads is considered good. This game is brutally difficult, but only when you don't know where to go and what to do to survive. Once you do know what to do, and can do those things without failure, then you're pretty much set. But until then, expect a lot of death and a lot of frustration, since even tiny mistakes can spell disaster. The original release of Mokhtar by Titus Software was in 1991, though Titus the Fox was released a year later in 1992, as primarily a one-player platformer. However, it should be noted the Game Boy and Game Boy Color releases specifically have support for two players playing simultaneously, a feature which was pretty much unheard of for a scrolling platformer back in the early 90s. Despite being a 90s game, it actually supports video modes all the way back to the monochrome Hercules cards. But it's also been coded in such a way that the VGA mode tries to run at 320 by 192 resolution for the actual gameplay which in turn bypasses the normal aspect ratio correction and gives a sort of letterboxed appearance on a CRT display. Though DOSBox doesn't seem to emulate this properly, at least not with Titus. Seems to handle Mokhtar fine though, so I'm not sure what's up with that. In terms of audio, it only supports the PC speaker and adlib cards. As for its current release date, it's still commercial and is one of the more recent releases on the good old games website at www.gog.com, where you can grab it for $10 which is going to sound like a steal once you go searching for physical copies. Supposedly, this game is ultra rare nowadays, but personally, I think it's just overpriced. And the way you can tell the difference is that when a game truly is ultra rare, finding copies is near impossible, and when you do, the prices are going to be through the roof. For Titus the Fox, finding copies was easy, as I managed to source dozens of them. And granted, about two-thirds of those were the Game Boy Color version, which is apparently the only release which isn't rare, and could thus be found for pretty cheap, but all the other ones were up to like $75 for a loose copy and well into the hundreds for fully boxed. If that level of rarity is to be believed, then why was I able to find so many copies available? Like, I get that it probably is a very rare game, but if that's true, and finding copies is easy, then the reason there's so many available is because they're not selling. 
and they're not selling despite their rarity because they're overpriced. Plain and simple. The objective of this game is very simple. Get to the end of each of 15 levels. Now, sometimes there's a boss to defeat, but ultimately, that's the main goal. However, this is way easier said than done, given a few aspects of how this game works. For starters, the screen has an unusual way of scrolling, likely a holdover from the game's Amiga roots, where instead of scrolling smoothly as Titus moves around, it scrolls in bursts whenever Titus reaches the edge of the screen, or whenever Titus stands still for a moment. This takes a lot of getting used to, and it's part of the reason why memorization is so important to survival, since if something dangerous is just off the edge of the screen, you may still get processed anyways, and potentially lob projectiles at you or start chasing you, not to mention your own attempts to toss stuff back are going to fail if they're too far off screen. The controls themselves are okay, but they could have been improved in how they're actually handled. The basic movement controls for left and right work fine, jumping is done with the up arrow, or up on a joystick, which kind of interferes with trying to throw objects straight up since you end up jumping in any attempt to do this. And you can also crouch down and crawl along the floor, which helps to get into narrow openings and can also help dodge some attacks. But there's still plenty of attacks which look like they could be crouched under, when in actuality, they're still going to hit you anyways. But you also have an action button, which on the keyboard is a spacebar. This could have used some extra work. But the thing is, unless you're holding an item, the action button does absolutely nothing. In fact, to pick up an item, you have to crouch down next to it and press the button while crouching. There's three problems with this. The first is that the instant you try to do this, you stop dead in your tracks. So trying to pick up something that's moving is difficult because you can't just race along with it, then duck and catch it very reliably. So you might just think, hold your hands out and catch it that way, which looks like it should work. But that's the second issue. It doesn't. Picking up objects only works on the specific frame where you push the action button while crouching. After that, Titus keeps his hands open, but will no longer pick up anything. The last issue though is that it's way too finicky. The actual range you can pick something up within is very small, meaning there'll be times you'll try to pick something up only for it to fail because you're one or two pixels too close or too far. This gets even more intense when you go around trying to pick up enemies, which I should emphasize, it's extraordinarily difficult to do and should not be attempted under any circumstances since there's never a benefit to doing so. Not to mention it only works from their backsides anyway, so if an enemy is coded to always face you, you can't pick them up ever. Actually, let's talk about the power-ups you find scattered around. The main power-ups you find are bonus treasures, padlocks, and magic lamps. Every level has one lamp in it, and if you can find it, you'll be given the password for the level so that you can start a new game from that level. The padlocks are checkpoints, so if you pick one up, you'll respawn in that general position when you die. As for the bonus treasures, these serve two purposes. Each will restore a single unit of health, but if you have maximum health already, they instead go towards a bonus counter, which is being tracked between levels. When you beat a level, this counter is checked, and for every 10 units, it'll tick them away and award an extra life. As far as health goes, I do like that the health meter looks like the volume meter off of an old CRT television, but at the same time, be prepared to see this drop fast. Whenever Titus gets hit, he goes flying, and there's little you can do to control yourself during this moment. What makes this worse, though, is there's no post-hit invincibility. Well, there technically is, but it barely lasts a fraction of a second, so you can easily end up losing tons of health very quickly as you get bounced around, unable to do much of anything. It is very possible to lose your entire health bar in one fell swoop if you get very unlucky. Plus, I should point out that spikes are an instant kill no matter how much health you have. However, you don't have to stand for some of this, as many levels are loaded with both secrets and shortcuts. The first level is a prime example of this. Right from the start, you see a ball item bounce in the top left of the screen, but there's seemingly no way to reach it. The ball object is pretty good, since it not only is a reusable throwing object, but you can also bounce on it like a springboard to reach higher spots. It's one of the best objects you can acquire for any level, and yet there it is just taunting you. Well, partway through the level is a door you can go through by holding down in front of it for a moment, which brings you to a rooftop with a bunch of platforms. But jumping across them all actually takes you all the way to the end of the level. But at the end of the level is another door, which will go all the way back to the start. 
but it drops you off up top where the ball is, so you can take it with you. Every level is loaded with secrets like these, some of which take a bit of clever thinking to reach. For instance, you can scale this wall, and the game gives you several boxes to do it with. But these boxes are not enough. A springboard would do it, but you needed to use a springboard to get here in the first place. So the trick is to drop down some of the boxes to where you use the springboard to get up, then bring the springboard up to this wall and put it on some of the other boxes. This shortcut not only gets you a ton of bonus treasures, but brings you right to the final chamber before the boss for this level. There's some other things to keep your eyes open for too. For instance, you can find magic carpets rolling around, which will let you glide through the air in one direction, though they can be very tricky to make proper use of. The same with the skateboards, which serve a similar purpose, but are stuck being used on the ground. And the kinds of objects you can find vary quite a bit too, like some will be destroyed if you toss them into an enemy, some won't, though all will stay intact if you let them fall on an enemy from a height, which is an important thing to keep in mind if you have lots of enemies but only a small number of objects to work with. But sometimes, survival just comes down to understanding the enemies. For instance, these guys with the slingshots will only fire their slingshots if they get close to you. But worse still, they'll change direction to do it, so you can't just land or run up behind them and get away with it. So in this level, when you're faced with two of them guarding the exit, the best way to get through here is to wake them both up, get onto the stairs to avoid them, then when one of them gets close, use tiny bounces to get in their line of sight so that they'll fire their slingshot, which pauses their movement. Once the two of them are synced up so that they're near each other, you can jump over both at the same time and get far enough away to get through the exit. This may seem exploitative, but I'm pretty sure the game was intentionally designed to work like this. There's seemingly impossible sections to get through, which I found can only be survived through manipulating the AI. So really, don't feel bad, just do whatever it takes to win. Besides, the game's hard enough already as it is. The last thing to mention is a bit of an oversight with the game mechanics. I already mentioned how if you toss something at an enemy off screen, it may miss them completely, since an enemy has to be at least a pixel on screen to have its collision checked. Well, the weird thing is that if you kill an enemy, it'll stay dead for the rest of the level, but if you don't, it can sometimes despawn if it gets too far away from where you are and its spawn point is off screen. If this happens, it'll immediately respawn at its spawn point, which even if it's off screen, if it's close enough to the player to be woken up, it will immediately wake up and act. This is something you absolutely have to be aware of when dealing with long stretches of flat ground and fast moving enemies. Overall, Titus the Fox is hard, but adaptable. Again, like Battletoads. This is absolutely not a game you would ever want to play casually, and so if you're looking to play a platformer just for simple enjoyment or just to relax, this is not the one you want to pick up, because it's just going to aggravate you into punching a hole through your computer. Instead, this is the kind of platformer to pick up when you want one that's going to be extremely challenging without giving much of a break, despite the secrets to be found. If that sounds appealing to you, then by all means, give it a shot. So, something you may have noticed in the footage is that the sprites were flickering a bit. And this seems to be DOSBox related, but I discovered it's more of a problem with the SVGA support being enabled. So, you actually have to set the machine type to VGA only to alleviate the flickering problem at least as much as possible. It's still present either way. Now, true, the problem will go away if you set a higher cycles count than just a thousand, but a thousand will give you what feels like the intended frame rate under most conditions. As if the frame rate goes too high, everything moves much faster and it's much harder to deal with as a result. Not to mention, too high a cycles count will break the ad lib sounds and music support in the process. One other thing to keep in mind though when using the VGA only setting is that this breaks compatibility with some of DOSBox's other features, notably OpenGL support on the Windows side of things, which is what I tend to recommend using given that Direct Draw has been deprecated since Windows 8 and doesn't work as well as it once did. Still, Direct Draw should work well enough, just be aware it's not going to be perfect. Anywho, that's all for this week's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Episode 241 is going to be on Saturday, July 7th, and we'll be taking a look at the sequel to one of the strategy games that I've covered in the past. And there's more than one game that this could be, so you're just going to have to trust your instincts when you send in your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com, and stay tuned to see just how similar to the original this sequel is, and if I can finally play it properly.
Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small sample, you guys.